All right, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, we're going to start, try to stay on time. We are the big finale. But uh, actually, I'm John Zanos. I'm with Canonical and uh, Ubuntu. Yeah, and I'm Toby Ford from AT&T. Uh, we're also both uh, board members on the OpenStack board. And uh, we decided to attack uh, the subject of NFE and OpenStack and open source. So we're going out big with the big subject at the end of the day. Um, what we hope to do is give you a sense of where we see challenges, how we think things are evolving, and also look for your help and your support and your input uh, through the course of what we're trying to do with OpenStack, NFE, and what we're trying to do with Neutron. Sure. So one of the big questions that we have with regard to supporting NFV in the telco context is how, how much can OpenStack do? And uh, I think in the OpenStack community itself, this is a challenge, is what, what is exactly the scope? What is it going to look like? Uh, and how, how big is it going to be? You know, as we show here, is, is it in the end just going to be a set of APIs and a whole lot of vendor plugins that make it work? Or is it going to actually have implementations that are meaningful and that can scale to the telco use cases? Um, is it going to devolve into some type of standards body then? Because if it's just APIs, then uh, it's just a long discussion about how, how the APIs evolve. Hopefully not. I think OpenStack has been a very good example of how you can evolve a system with practical deployments, with practical code, to actually make an API that's built from real evolution. Yeah, and we think, you know, we have this question of, is it going to try to be the X service of everything? Is it going to try to solve all network management problems? You know, at the end of the day, is it going to be the mother of all open source projects? We all know it's grown rapidly. We're all contributing. It's moved faster than any other open source project ever. And I think lastly, we're trying to stop some of the insanity. You know, this is a project that's moving so fast, we're wondering if we're going to drive our all, all of ourselves insane, given that when you overlay NFV, SDN, OpenStack, how do we do this? And what we're proposing is some concepts that really are designed to kind of put things into a much more manageable box, to some degree make things a little bit more sane. Yeah. This is mine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when you look at the telecom, telecom industry, it's going through rapid, rapid change. New challenges, new opportunities, new evolution, new competitors. And it's forcing this industry faster than ever before to rethink its fundamental premises. How does it operate? How does it take cost out of the equation? And lastly, how does it live in a new world where there's different competitors, different opportunities? and more importantly, different models. Yeah, exactly. And when, when we look at the competitors that we're at, we think we're going to have to be uh, working against in the future, if you look at Google Fiber or Google Loon or uh, some of the things that Amazon, Netflix do in the TV space, these are clearly coming for what we're doing. So, and when we look at them, the track record they have in terms of efficiency, just taking like this metric of how many devices uh, can be managed by one person, uh, we are at a significant disadvantage. We have hundreds of thousands of people uh, doing what uh, really could, should be a much larger scope. And this, I think this is a broad problem across the telco industry. How can we get away from some of the old concepts uh, of operations and move on to the, some of the newer concepts without uh, obviously risking the stability of the environments that everybody uses today. So we, we recognize, I'm going to step on this side, the way the stage is set up. It's a little awkward being so close to Toby. Um, <laughs> even though I like Toby. <laughs> the reality is you're seeing a very different model, right? A model where scale up appliances were structured for stability, familiarity, um, and rock solidness. Innovation happened, happened in five-year cycles. This new world is a very different world. Looks like this, innovation happens in the world we live in. It happens every six months. Probably happens every week. Just takes us six months to kind of let a new release come out. Incredibly fast, incredibly different. 
than the multi-year, five-year, six-year, seven-year planning cycle of a traditional telecom. Now, in a wireline world, that was an absolutely rock-solid decision. The fact that we all can turn on our cell phone in China, New York, London, Paris, and it works seamlessly is in upon itself an accomplishment that we shouldn't minimize. And when we go to bed, pray to all the telecoms that it works again tomorrow. But it's a very different model than this model. Yeah, so today, in the uh, typical telco space, we're using essentially what, what I think of as an equivalent to using mainframe computers. Very vertically integrated boxes that come from one or two vendors, or three vendors, that do a whole lot of uh, scaled function, but it's typically one function. And typically things that also, when you look at it from an IT lens, is duplicative of what we've already solved for. So like, take one of these examples, the session border controller. It is essentially a firewall and a load balancer for SIP traffic. This, I think, could easily be replaced not just by vert taking the session border controller and virtualizing it and getting all the benefits of consolidation and, and stuff that we've gotten out of virtualization over the last 10 years, but also po possibly even being part of a SDN service chain so that we're not having to uh, have something unique and special to manage, but it's actually part of the fabric itself. So the shortcomings of the existing setups, uh, we can't underestimate the, the challenge that we have of moving, on to the, moving them onto a new platform while keeping them running. So we have, in our world, the challenge we think about all the time is, do we add, augment these with virtualization off, uh, to the side? Or do we do a completely net new thing and start over again? Do we wait for 5G to happen? Or do we wait for uh, maybe some acquisitions to be finished before we start this process? Or do we dive in now and try to get the benefits that we see uh, have happened, not just because of virtualization uh, and, like I was saying, consolidation, high asset utilization, and moving faster, but also the benefits that we see in terms of the ecosystem. Can we get the benefits of the PC revolution, the, the Linux revolution, and the open source revolution that has happened over the last 30 years? And I think of I think OpenStack as kind of the pinnacle of that work, is how do we uh, actually maintain a project that has many federated pro aspects that work together, but very independently and move fast and move fast very quickly. That evolutionary model that we've created, though, uh, scares the telcos, it scares us. How, how can we uh, rely on something that's moving quickly uh, and is continuously deployed and is very agile at the same time we maintain high levels of nines for your phone service? Yeah. So it, it's interesting, right? We're talking about speed and stability, innovation and, you know, planning and operational efficiency. But at the end of the day, the benefits are very big, very big for us as end users of this technology because we see the innovation. We're all using the innovation. It's very big for the telcos because you get a benefit just from the commoditization of the hardware. We can debate the percentages, but we think the hardware is a minimal impact as compared to a benefit from virtualization. But if you just hit the button, Toby, the big play out is here. Right, we're changing the operating model. So think of it. What we're talking about is a metric of how many machines managed by a person. If you look at the Google, the major cloud providers, we're talking thousands, hundreds by an individual. The ratios are much, much lower in the average telecom. So it's not only about innovation and speed, but it's about fundamental P&L impacts. And as you all know, if you read anything in the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, this is an industry that is changing, competing in a very competitive market, and also trying to figure out how to make investments at the same time bringing forward innovation, and at the same time competing against companies that didn't have the legacy burden of running a wireless network the responsibility to make sure your cell phone works in New York as well as in Shanghai as well as any place else in Africa, right? This is a model that was built on stability and in a framework of solid planned innovation. Now they're in a world that is all about rapid, rapid, rapid. 
Yeah, and no, to add to that, I think if you gave me 100 really good people and uh, enough capital, I think you could reproduce what a telco does fairly readily. But that's not really the challenge that I have. The challenge is all about taking 1,000-person, 10,000-person ops teams and getting them to think differently, to, to realign their paradigms. And this is a much bigger challenge than I, that I believe than the actual technology. But I believe strongly that the open source model and the community around, let's say, OpenStack and other open source projects like Linux and like uh, other uh, projects that are just now coming to, to bear uh, can help make this work better, work faster and provide examples for how we can make this change. So this is a picture uh, brought to us by our friends at Etsy, one of the standards bodies uh, that uh, we work with very closely to help with getting all the telcos to think uh, in a similar way around how things work. We help to drive this uh, concept within Etsy to try to, at least at the beginning, standardize nomenclature for what pieces are. Now, there's a still a lot of argument that maybe this isn't exactly right, but I think it does provide at least uh, some very common terminology that we can use to talk about what needs to, to happen. And especially for me, I focus primarily on the underlying NFVI, or the infrastructure of NFV, uh, and how to solve for this piece. Um, and then in this area, OpenStack plays a very significant role, uh, as well as do SDN providers, and as well as uh, a number of other entities that do workflow and operational management tools. Maybe before you, we get off this, so, you know, if you look at this, you recognize where OpenStack fits in. You know where there's elements of open source projects, and there's also a very important opportunity for application automation and management. And there's a number of projects, right, and a number of communities, as well as individual companies attacking this. Where we see a lot of benefit is the open source community trying to attack these problems, but we also see some risk. And some of the risk is this is the whole watermelon of the problem, right? So it's a complex problem to take a telecom from where it is today, like AT&T, to this end state is, in one swoop, is a very daunting problem. We think the way you need to approach it is look at it as iterative steps. And a little bit of what we're going to be talking through the remainder is trying to coach all of us as a community to think about this in digestible blocks. And that's the important point, right? Because right now, if you look at this project, this project for any telecom is the holy grail of end state, but actually implementing it in one big swoop is just not even on the table. Yeah, and another point to add here, too, is clearly, in the past, when we ran the physical versions of these network functions, they each came with their own orchestration and management tooling. I think there's a great opportunity right now, not just to make that more cohesive or contiguous, want more homogeneous, making this a much simpler model, but also to kind of bring in innovation. Like say, instead of traditional BPEL or BPM tools, uh, instead maybe think more broadly in using PaaS tools and be more part of the developer life cycle and how they work uh, and how they bring code into the picture. So making this, this is very helpful for an operational person in a telco to understand how things change. But I think how we bring the developer into this picture is going to be equally important. So, you know, Toby said an important thing, and it's a, a word I think historically hasn't been used in the telecom industry as much as it is now, and that's developer, right? A lot of the innovation we're talking about is now encapsulated in software as compared to the appliance. And a lot of the innovation is helping the telcos make this transition to, you know, virtualization of, of ne network functions. Now, as we've talked about, not all these are easy, not all these lend themselves immediately to scale out there's some steps, some evaluation. But at the end of the day, to bring that innovation on top of the network, to bring those new features to the end users, what we are talking about is a development exercise, and that's being deployed through the exercise of some communities. Some of it's proprietary, but all of it is software-oriented. You want to hit the second point? Yeah, and then 
it, what we've seen within OpenStack is and an example I went through yesterday was about the VLAN trunking issue. Is uh, I think it provides a good uh, good sort of use case to look at and has how OpenStack um, needs to evolve. The people within open the community need to be more aware of the NFV use cases and what what kind of challenges we have. This particular one represents, unfortunately, sort of a legacy concept that has to be brought forward for an interim period of time until we get to a, maybe a longer term vision where the VNFs are truly ca cattle-like or scale out. This is one of those things which people have not universally agreed with, but is essential for us to make progress and to be able to deploy today. So this is an example where both we need to kind of think differently, think more broadly about the use cases for what OpenStack can do, but also uh, working with a new set of people, new set, set of uh, specialties around uh, telco and, and, and a new set of vendors like uh, Ericsson's ALUs, and then uh, also helping those companies that provide VNFs to evolve their platform to be more scale out. So, so at the end of the day, one of the things we're advocating and we're encouraging to the extent we both can and our re respective companies can, is we recognize this NFV network virtualization is a very daunting problem, as we said, and not easily digested by any telecom of any size. But we do think there's a path forward. One, we believe you can get to a purpose-built NFV. So NFV in its broadest sense is about all the functions of the network or the vast majority. But you can deploy NFVs in very discrete areas where maybe you're focusing on one or two or three functions. Why is that important? That's important that it allows you at least to get into it in a digestible way, in a piece that's manageable. The second part is we do think this is possible via manageable open source collaboration. Though we, we wrestled with these four or five words because they always don't <laughs> line up together. But the idea that if we can get ourselves as a community looking at the problem in definable chunks and then attacking them as definable chunks, not just attacking the total problem, even though that's probably the more interesting problem, we can make it iterative steps forward. And that's probably going to be more important in the foreseeable future, both in terms of actually having impact within the telecoms and also in terms of doing something that's actually achievable and that we can see the results and proof out the benefits that we all believe exist with virtualizing the network. Yeah, and as, as John is saying, for us, we're not going to try to do a whole mobility system uh, right away. We're going to try to take pieces and parts and focus on, let's say, a small enterprise set of customers to, to begin with, and then try to make progress there with a subset, and then move on and gradually, uh, iteratively, get to uh, the broader set of function that we're getting to, or needing to address. So. In general, the OpenStack collaborations that we've had um, they start, certainly, to me, start with code and uh, working together as a teams. But uh, within a telco, it's, it's been a bit of a challenge, and I believe it's true for more than just AT&T, is actually convincing people that you need to apply resources and developers that actually can, can make a difference and then participate in it without all the normal encumbrances of old companies like IP and, and, uh, and certain sort of uh, challenges with competitors and such. This, this idea of working outside of AT&T is really unique. It's very much a uh, type of environment where everything is about what you're doing today within your organization opening up and being more aware of what's happening outside is, is a very new phenomenon for the telcos. So it starts with that, and it always starts with that. And then, obviously, there's legal challenges with licenses and such that we're hopeful that uh, you know, we can pivot the, the lawyers to the right, in the right direction. Obviously, beyond that is yeah. about partnership with uh, an ecosystem you know, and I think John and I represent some small subset of that. Yeah, I think, you know, the other thing coming from the side that a company that's DNA is based in open source, you know, we recognize that this is a pretty big pivot for most telecoms. You know, that pesky IP thing gets in the way of a lot of discussions, but we recognize that what we've done, we've opened up 
our technology, our software, make the code available, all the stuff we do in open source projects. And we team with the telcos to help them navigate that understanding and build a degree of confidence and comfort in doing that very thing. So manageable collaboration is easily said challenging to do. And the only way we think we move forward successfully is you know, to use OpenStack as an illustration, we continue to build up the number of telecom developers that feel like they're enabled to be very ac active. And Toby's done a great job of representing that. Helping them understand that, you know, getting together on IRC and talking through the problems they're having with code isn't giving away the family secrets to the other guy who happens to have a V in front of his name as compared to an A. You know, that evolution is going through in a very thoughtful way within the telecoms because there is, as we pointed out in the beginning, a very competitive landscape. But I think the benefit, and again, the reason we think about this as kind of purpose-built NFV is that we want to create little proof points that demonstrate the model works. And then the other thing is this comment, uh, not that I think the telecoms are imperfect, but that, like all of us, they have a couple challenges evolving in this model. And this is an area where we, as people that live in an open source community or in the, the business model that is open source, need to recognize that you may be dealing with somebody that's going through a bit of internal um, evolution. And while their intent is to be very active, they may have constraints internally that are pulling them one way or the other. Exactly. You know, when I began at AT&T, open source was outlawed, and then you couldn't get to IRC from inside the network. And hopefully, we've made progress in that regard over time. And it's also uh, it's, uh, contributing code using GitHub or, or something of the, the like. That was completely unheard of. In fact, we didn't even use Git or anything like Git before that. So this is uh, uh, something that we've, we've moved on from, I think. Now, one of the things that we're struggling with, and, and this is partly my ask to this group today, is, you know, where does it go from here? How do we, what are the next steps or what do we participate in and to make this work, to actually uh, build on what OpenStack has done? Does that mean uh, bringing in all sorts of other open source projects, uh, working with them and then trying to integrate things? Uh, you know, I think of right now as, as I begin the steps into OPNFV, I kind of have an existential question is, how much can we get these different groups and also the vendors that go along with them uh, to actually work together and collaborate? Obviously, there's a lot of, of uh, motivation given the trillions of dollars that the telco space represent. But for me, this is a, a very complex story when we try to put it all together. Yeah, when we, when we compare notes, it's an interesting problem for all of us, right? Because it's like puppies, they just keep propagating and propagating, and we all get the calls, and Toby and I talk about it. Can you participate in this? Can you assign some engineers in that? We're the future, we're the future, we'll collaborate with everybody, and it's, it's a challenging thing when you think of the talent pool isn't limitless, right? There's talent that we want dedicated and focused on complex problems. And as a community where we propagate so many efforts that are slightly different but near same, we create a problem of distributing our focus. Now, this is also where innovation occurs, right? So this is a very careful tightrope to walk because the separation and multiple efforts has created a lot of innovation that we've all been part of. But what we're recognizing in NFV is given the size of the opportunity and the magnitude of the space under the telecoms of the world, there's a a rapid propagation that we need to be careful about. Because what happens is we distribute ourselves into many, many projects. We distribute our efforts, our resources, our dollars. And we're wondering collectively, I'll say just Toby and I, are we helping or hurting the problem? Exactly. Now, I feel like in some cases, obviously, I want to see innovation continue. And I, I like the idea of, of a person starting something up and making progress. But at the same time, if you look at the problem globally and across the telcos, there's actually, in many cases, a lot of redundant work. If you look at just take SDN as an example, at some point, I find that we're actually only perpetuating maybe our ego or, uh, you know, there's, I made this and so I want to see this baby grow. 
uh, that at some point uh, defies logic and makes everything very dilutive. And so I think in many areas, we have to really challenge ourselves and justify, is what I'm doing really differentiated or not? And then help, because as much as, in, you know, in Agile, when we iteratively build everything, at some point we have to refactor. And in, in this space, across all of what we're doing, I think that's probably a good idea for us to, to look at and can we refactor some of these projects? Yeah, and I think the, th the thing that we also want to support is where there is differentiation being crea created and real innovation, we absolutely want to put support and focus around those efforts. Now, if we all had the perfect magic ball, we would know that at the beginning of the process, which is hard, but we certainly should watch it very carefully. But it, if you do have a proprietary thing, uh, for us, that has to be wrapped with interfaces in, uh, in a way that allows us to, to work within open source projects. It cannot be an independent thing. The days when we bought a, an entire solution to this problem from one vendor is gone. Uh, it's going to be a very, uh, you know, many vendors and many different solutions that actually solve this problem. Right. So we wanted to use an example, uh, and this is an example because it's gotten a lot of recent focus, but we look at this and we say, you know, the many more and many efforts and doing many things, and the question that we've been wrestling with is, is it the answer? Is it making things better? Is it not? Now, everybody can have their own perspective, but we do think, you know, we should be asking these very questions, and most importantly, when we allocate resources, how are things progressing and how are they not? Yeah, exactly. So this is one of the existential problems that I'm wrestling with right now is, uh, can I even explain how I can make, a or why I would make a cloud stack work with a day open daylight with a Zen? You know, and what are all the different permutations that we really meaningfully want to test? Um, I like this idea. I think it's going to be helpful. But the question is, is it going to be helpful enough quickly enough? And is it going to be too complex of a problem to solve for? Where, where do I even begin? And so that's uh, what we're wrestling with. Does this even make sense in the end? Right. And again, this gets to this concept of purpose-built NFV, or more importantly, manageable, definable projects that actually have a chance of reaching some sort of coalesced conclusion in a foreseeable future and actually resulting in something deployed that can be used. Exactly. So. In the end, you know, I think uh, we, we absolutely need the help. And then I think in a number of ways, you know, uh, we, we, I, I want to accentuate the part about OpenStack that is a standard API. I really like the idea of a multitude of solutions in the OpenStack community, some of which are pure native implementations, but then others where creativity is involved, but as long as the APIs are standard and consistent, then the, what happens behind the scenes can be continually innovated. So, you know, we've made good progress in the foundation on Def Core and RefStack and the, the like, but that I find to be typically, uh, it is, is good progress, but is somewhat biased toward the implementation side. And then whereas I'd like to see, and we're making progress here in the next period of time, taking that and then making it more about a trademark for API compatibility, which I think will have much broader uh, applicability to the problem. So this is the part where Toby and I decided to step a little close to the edge of the ledge and at least try to give what we think as two individuals some guidance. You know, certainly we are all aware that Neutron has a number of shortcomings. <laughs> We think the right way to attack it is to focus on the API side of it and let other people plug in it and expose more network functionality. We, we believe NFV is a big proposition that we should all be focused on and spend time thinking about. But at the same time, we think we should break it into chunks that are manageable, digestible, and actually implementable and demonstrate and proof out the value that we all believe is in there and not get so caught up in solving the mega problem that in two years from now, we haven't moved forward at all. And I want to leave us with one, one possibility that, that I've been considering is, uh, given the track record of OpenStack, can it actually uh, be the center of gravity? And then can we maybe uh, 
flatten some of these outside efforts into OpenStack so that it can uh, maybe more broadly solve for uh, network issues, as, as one example. Yeah, and I, I think at the end of the day, you know, we view this as a big we problem and big, and big challenge. Not everybody can have the same opinions and not everybody needs to have them. We wanted to do a couple things in this session. One, at least share some perspective on what's going out there. Give some ideas at least how we wrestle with it. Not that that's the perfect solution or the only solution. And try to put some guardrails on the conversation, at least from our perspective. Um, we hope you found it helpful. Um, we're happy to answer any questions. We're certainly here today and tomorrow. And uh, please feel free to step up to any of us and give us your opinion, good or bad. And thanks for your time. All right, any, any questions? If you have a question, there's uh, two microphones here in the front and the back. Uh, hey, Toby, this is Srikant uh, from HP. Yeah. Uh, question on the NFE value proposition. How much of it is hinged upon the uh, VNFs being really written for an NFE world? And I don't mean just replicating VMs for a scale up to create a cattle scenario, but essentially being thought of in the new NFE paradigm? That's question number one, and the question two, I'll, I'll wait, but I have one more. Yeah, so the first thing, I think there's gonna be an interim state, and we can get value out of NFV uh, without going all the way. Mm -hmm. But I'm hopeful before we implement something significant like a 5G or the next generation TV platform, mm -hmm. that those platforms are end up being designed in a more, more integrated and more scale-out model. The second uh, question. Okay. Yep. Uh, we've heard yesterday. I think it was multiple flavors of Android, and there was an analogy drawn for multiple flavors of OpenStack. Do you see an NFV flavor for OpenStack kind of becoming more and more popular, or do you want to just keep everything? I I think it's inevitable that there's going to be a an NFV flavored OpenStack distribution of some kind, whether or not we make it or uh, another telco makes it or that's the actual output of OPNFV. I think that part's inevitable, but I'm hopeful that um, we can actually work together so that there's not a lot of those. I would just add one point. I think yeah. when we've talked about this, we want to keep a very strong core of OpenStack, of core and other things, so you don't have, you have the improvement around the edges and you don't have so many propagations of different models that portability and interoperability is lost in the process. Right on. Rod Randall from uh, Cirrus Capital. One of the things that has come out in a number of conversations is that there are a large number of virtual network functions that would be implemented in a substantial implementation of NFV, many of which have their own management and orchestration. In the presentation just before you guys came on, the presenter, from uh, Stefan from, from Deutsche Telekom, mentioned that they decided that orchestration should have only one owner in terms of actually deciding resources and that all of the individual functions needs to sort of request from the broad view of orchestration who then will resolve all the issues and allocate all of the components. As I understand it, OpenNFV hasn't chosen to take that on. Should that be something that should be standardized, or is that an area for innovation? And if innovation comes with a difference from how it's being, being viewed, how do you see integrating that into the, into the real world of, of making these things work? Sure. So my view is a little bit different. I think that's a, that is maybe a goal, uh, but the interim between now and then is going to be very much of a patchwork of different VNF managers, and right now OPNFV is not dealing with the, the VNF manager problem at all. Uh, I think, in a way, that provides an opening for innovation to happen. And I'm very hopeful that, as I said in the presentation, that we start to take on uh, more PaaS-like and developer-friendly concepts, because in the end, the goal is, is more of a DevOps model or infrastructure as a code model, rather than just perpetuating the same the same wacky belief that a business analyst is going to be able to, to configure a whole system in a, in a BPEL tool, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And, I, you know, the one thing I would add is in my conversations with the telecoms, 
Toby's point about being more PaaS centric or developer centric or DevOps centric is an important evolution that's going on. So when you think of the holy grail of solving that problem and innovation, it changes very differently if you think of it in a DevOps model as compared to a traditional telecom model from an operations perspective. And I think the the real opportunity for innovation is if you look a couple steps out, and we think the first couple steps that we said are some smaller definable projects, but ultimately if you want to solve that problem, start thinking about it from the perspective of a developer who's creating new code to, to create new value to the end user mm -hmm. as compared to running a network. Mm -hmm. Right. I got you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, so Beth Cohen, I'm from the V uh, Telecom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and Please come up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and and I'm, a, uh, I'm a big proponent that we do need to get more involved in, in this, but, um, but I'm struggling with, you know, just the not invented here kind of attitudes. Um, and, and I think also, and I'm sure you run into this as well, that um, the way that IT services are developed and delivered are, is a different, it's, you know, it's a different balance. Things are in different locations in the organization, and I struggle with, well, why did you do that? That was a stupid thing to do. You didn't even think, think it through, you know? <laughs> sure. No, I mean, in, within at t we have the same not invented here issue. Now, in some cases, I think there's, it's justified. If we have real unique, something unique, and that's, that's fine. But understanding, and this is my, where my external content uh, concept comes out, is a willingness to look outside to say, wait a minute, what are other people doing, and then really understanding what is differentiated or not. That's, that's one part of it. For us, uh, and I was just saying this, uh, John, earlier today, is about the, uh, I've been at AT&T for eight years, and on, I've been on a kind of a constant uh, uh, journey to try to converge efforts. And I've gotten through like maybe five or six clouds to be all part of one thing, because I honestly believe without being all part of one common infrastructure, we'll never have uh, be cost effective. Uh, still, there's four or five more to go. So, are, are you going to share your challenging, stupid, uh, not stupid, but challenging, stupid thing? I'll say it's stupid. What's Within AT and T, I, I, where I you have a challenging, stupid thing that oh, I can what's share. That? It, it's so classic. Um, so we we added a new product and we we changed the billing to it was a new way of billing things, and the business analyst put together the requirement, and the IT person, you know wrote up the code and they forgot that if you're going to do usage-based billing, 1,000 is not the same as 1,024. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you, you know, I would add, because we deal with telecoms across the world, and, and I think there's a couple elements to this as well. One is a lot of difference per geography, per culture, right? And this pace of evolution in terms of the internal thinking is very different. So as a community, you have to be sensitive to somebody in Verizon may be different than somebody in Deutsche Telekom that may be somebody different in Singtel compared to NTT. And, and, and I should point out, we all do talk to each other. Right. <laughs> well, you know, the interesting thing, I think ultimately there's a model to be replicated, right? The reason the wireline world works isn't because everybody ran a wire everywhere, right? You have your arrangements with other telecoms. And I think it's interesting from somebody that's in the open source world that you were able to navigate as an industry making those relationships. And then in this cloud world, world you're a little bit more sensitive of your IP. I think that's actually driven by a little bit of fear and newness. But you have a great model that you've already executed completely sex successfully in the wireline and wireless business to allow calls to happen around the world. And one of the things we've talked a little bit about is how do you allow that model to propagate itself amongst the telecoms, again, in this new community-based open source world. Yeah, I'll, I'll relate the story John's <laughs> referring to. Is, uh, and it's actually a beautiful surprise, not, not necessarily stupid, but... Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean any offense. We recently reorged to be a much simpler organization, and then uh, and nowadays I own some part of cloud architecture, and someone called me up and, and was in a confessional mood and said, uh, you know, Toby, we forked off of your uh, OpenStack setup two years ago, and we built out this environment. It's now deployed in 12 data centers. And then, uh, um, I know you don't know about this, but <laughs> that, that was by intent. <laughs> so, certainly not stupid, but a good illustration of the different pockets and the size of telco. Uh, and we 
we, we have from the Ericsson. same thing. Uh, yeah. Question is on DevOps. You mentioned DevOps a few times yes. uh, during the talk. So the question is, uh, it is one thing to have continuous integration, continuous development, DevOps type of uh, flow for the services that at and is developing, uh, or the, any operator is developing, but do you see the same thing applied to network functions, uh, virtualized network functions? And if so, how do you yeah, see I mean, it working with multiple vendors who are supporting these network functions or supplying the network functions to you? Well, one thing as, as a base to answer your question about applying DevOps and NFV, uh, I mean, I'm a strong proponent that uh, you cannot achieve a resilient system without having uh, some aspects that you need to make continuous integration deployment work, right? You need complete test uh, coverage. You need complete automation of testing. This actually, for us, helps tremendously beyond what we were doing before. We were very manually targeting testing, and that, that takes years sometimes to, you know, in one of our systems we just went live with, it took us five years to, to implement because of the testing involved. Uh, and that's, that, that old way goes away when you have continuous integration. Now, the idea of deploying all the time and such, that's going to take work. And so that's one of my challenges of vendor community around us is how do we, how do we work together to, to bring things into a, sort of a common re repository and then build and deploy off of that in a reliable, consistent way. I mean, that's, that's a big challenge. So. Okay. And, and, and I think ultimately... You got to recognize that the telecoms are competing against a much bigger world, right? And the benefits of DevOps, they see them every day in their competition. They see them in the innovation that's happening in other places. So that balance has to be struck, but, but they're in a car, right, that's running very fast against other cars. So, you know, our advice always to the telecoms is don't become so inwardly focused that you worry about it as compared to how you did it yesterday. The, really question, the real question is how are you doing it compared to everybody else that you're competing with? And if you're not able to run fast enough and keep up, even though you may have a bias or a preference or you're worried about stability, you may not have the luxury to hang on to that model. I think we're probably at a... Yeah, I apologize. We, uh, we're going over. Next thing has to happen. Feel free to come up and ask questions. Thank you, you very like. much. Thank you.